Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, webinar from the Benign Essential Blepharospasm Research Foundation. Um, today, we're talking about deep brain stimulation for blepharospasm and dystonia. I'm very excited to welcome you to this presentation. We've had a lot of people asking about deep brain stimulation. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, our presenters today. And remember, for questions, submit them through the Q&A icon. Our first speaker today is Svetlana Miosinovich, a board-certified neurologist specializing in Parkinson's disease, dystonia, tremor, and other movement disorders. She graduated from medical school in 2009 at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, where she also obtained a PhD in biomedical engineering. She completed neurology residency and clinical movement disorders fellowship at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Her postdoctoral training and clinical research fellowship was at the University of California San Francisco Movement Disorder and Neuromodulation Center. She was awarded American Brain Foundation and Estonia Medical Research Foundation grants to study electrophysiology of movement disorders and effects of deep brain stimulation on the basal ganglia and cortical circuitry. In 2016, she moved to Emory to become an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology, Movement Disorders section. Her clinical focus is on developing expert patient care and using DBS to treat movement disorders. And she will be our first speaker. Our second speaker is Dee Lindy. Dee served on the board of directors of BEBRF as advocacy chair and as Western District Director. She also works on advocacy with the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation. She graduated from California State University Hayward with a bachelor's degree in sociocultural anthropology. She also graduated from Chapman University with a master of arts degree in counseling psychology. She then became a practicing psychotherapist. Prior to this, Dee was served in the United States Navy, where she served as a neurographer's mate and dealt with oceanography, meteorology, and anti-submarine warfare. She is currently very active on the paddling crew of a dragon boat team comprised entirely of breast cancer su survivors, and she is an official Oregon State University Master Gardener volunteer. Most importantly, Dee is one of the first people in the United States to undergo deep brain stimulation procedure for dystonia, and therefore she is uniquely qualified to give the patient's perspective. So now I am going to turn the program over to Dr. Miasinovich. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here. Let me try and share my screen. Okay, can you see this? I can. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much for the invitation and for um, the introduction. Uh, as Charlene mentioned, I am a movement disorder neurologist and my focus, um, my clinical practice focus is deep brain stimulation. So today I will give you about a 30 minute overview of what uh, DBS is and how it is performed. And then uh, I will also describe how well DBS works for dystonia and blepharospasm uh, in particular. And then we will finish uh, with some considerations um, for when uh, you may uh, consider DBS um, for treatment of blepharospasm. Uh, so just to make sure that we are all on the same page, uh, very briefly, blepharospasm is uh, involuntary spasms of the eyelid muscles. It is a type of focal dystonia. Dystonia is a more general term for neurologic condition um, due to dysfunction in the brain's motor coordination centers. Blepharospasm can be either primary or essential or pure blepharospasm. And uh, it can also be secondary, meaning it is associated with another condition or due to a specific cause that is known. The treatments for blepharospasm can be behavioral. So this is examples such as tinted glasses or sensory gestures that uh, sometimes can be helpful. 
Oral medications um, can sometimes be helpful, but oftentimes um, they may not because they can cause too many systemic side effects. So the first line therapy for blepharospasm is oftentimes botulinum toxin injections. In case um, injections don't work, then patients can consider surgery. So there is ophthalmologic surgery, so the surgery on the eyelids themselves or neurosurgery such as deep brain stimulation, which is what we will talk about today. So DBS uh, can essentially be described as a pacemaker for the brain. So the system consists of um, electrodes, so actually two electrodes, usually one on each side of the brain um, that's implanted into these motor coordination centers and then an extension wire that is threaded underneath the skin and connected to a pulse generator that is implanted in the chest below the clavicle. The pulse generator looks almost exactly the same as a cardiac pacemaker, which is more common, so more people have seen those. This is the, um, a, a schematic of the brain and the basal ganglia refers to this region deep inside the brain. These are the motor coordination centers that go awry in dystonia and blepharospasm. And so the electrodes are implanted typically in this area called the globus pallidus right here, this dark blue area, and sometimes also in the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, deep brain stimulation is um, an established therapy, so it is not experimental. Um, it has been in use since 1980s. It was initially developed for treatment of tremor, such as essential tremor and Parkinsonian tremor, and then uh, Parkinson's disease uh, more generally. In 2003, it was FDA approved for primary dystonia. And today it is um, standard of care in movement disorders and it is covered by insurance companies. This is a view of DBS equipment. So um, again, we have brain electrodes. The size of the electrode is 1.2 millimeters across. So it it's about a size um, and the shape of a thin spaghetti noodle. This, these are the stimulators or the batteries that are implanted in the chest. Clinician has their clinician programmer that they use to access the device and program the settings. And patient has their home programmer that they can use at home to, to either turn the device on and off as needed or to make some small adjustments uh, under the guidance of their physician. This is an image from uh, one of our surgeries. So uh, patients are um, what we call um, in the awake state, meaning that um, local anesthesia and, and is used to um, for any eventually painful parts such as uh, drilling of the skull. And then the patient is woken up uh, because um, it is necessary to record brain activity to know where exactly to put the electrodes and to make sure that the electrodes um, don't cause um, side effects that it would be unexpected. So it may sound scary at first to be awake during brain surgery, but um, all of our patients tolerate it really well, or most of them do, um, and it is not um, as scary as it may sound on f at first sight. So this is, I like this picture because this is also from one of our surgeries. And you can see a patient is lying here. This is the big, this big donut around their head is a CT uh, scanner. And this is uh, one of our surgeons. And uh, we had a patient who really, really wanted to know what we were doing back there. So our surgeon got the textbook, the neurosurgery textbook, and he is showing him exactly what we were doing while he has electrodes sticking out of his head. So we, we have fun during surgery. Um, but uh, there's also another way of doing uh, implanting DBS electrodes, and this is oftentimes referred to as a sleep DBS. So in that this case, uh, the surgery is actually performed inside the MRI scanner. So MRI room is turned into a surgical suite. And instead of uh, performing brain recordings to find the right place uh, in the brain to, for the electrodes, 
surgeon is uh, watching where the electrodes are going in real time using MRI scanner. So both of these techniques um, uh, um, achieve about similar results, um, again, in experienced centers who have experience with both types of implantations. So surgery is only the first part um, of the DBS procedure. So I always tell my patients that surgery is the easy part. It's really the DBS programming that comes afterwards that can take some time. So DBS programming refers to adjustment of the stimulation parameters because every person has slightly different brain anatomy. Everybody's electrode is in a slightly different place. Everybody has different symptoms. So neurologists will spend uh, several months programming the device. So the patient will come uh, usually about once a month or once every one to two months, um, and then adjustments will be made. And this is particularly important to remember for dystonia, such as and blepharospasm, that it can take several weeks to months to see any benefit. So um, I often caution patients that they will not probably see any changes when they come and have their device first turned on. It will take time. And again, it takes literally weeks to months to see the benefit. So it is important to consider that when undergoing surgery. What about uh, complications? So this is brain surgery. So there are complications. The most feared complication is a brain bleed. So this can happen in about uh, one to 2% of people who undergo BBS procedure. Uh, if it does happen, it will usually happen within the first 24 hours. So while the patient is still in the hospital. And oftentimes uh, there may be some bleeding on the on the MRI, but the person won't have any symptoms, in which case uh, we call it asymptomatic bleeding. Um, however, sometimes symptoms can be severe, so essentially it is as if um, having a stroke, a bleeding stroke, um, and there have been deaths from DBS procedures. So again, it is very rare, but we always have to discuss um, that this is a possibility. Infection is a slightly uh, more common complication, usually between three to 10%, depending on someone's underlying risk factors. The infection can happen either at the incision um, at the chest where the pulse generator is implanted, or also um, in the incision on the head where the electrodes are placed. Um, and again, this usually happens within the first one to two months after surgery, but it can happen really at any time. So we always warn patients if they notice any kind of redness or swelling um, to let us know right away. Oftentimes infection can be treated with oral antibiotics, but in some cases the entire system has to be taken out, IV antibiotics taken, and then when everything clears, it can be placed back in. There are also uh, various stimulation induced side effects. So the electrical current that is applied through the device can cause unwanted uh, effects, side effects. And um, in case of Globus pallidus stimulation where we, that we use for um, uh, blepharospasm, uh, these can be changes in speech, uh, sometimes visual changes, um, and then less commonly mood and cognitive changes, and also motor changes. So motor slowing can sometimes happen um, as a side effect of uh, stimulation in, dy in dystonia. But again, the advantage of deep brain stimulation is that these are reversible and adjustable, right? So if um, side effects do occur, stimulation can be titrated up or down. And then there is also hardware malfunction. So lead breaks, um, battery breaks, but those are pretty, pretty rare uh, with newer types of devices. Okay, so now I will um, show you a video. And actually, I think I'm gonna have to reshare my screen so that I can share um, audio. So one second. Okay, I think you, you will be able to hear sound now. So, so I will show you several videos. Um, these are not my patients. Um, these are videos that have been published in medical journals. So these people have consented to have their um, videos um, shown publicly. And you will hear uh, from this man, he will describe his um, experience with blepharospasm. So he 
uh, received DBS specifically for primary or essential blepharospasm. And his symptoms started about... Uh... Can, can you hear the sound, Charlene? I just want to make sure before I play the whole video. Yes, we can. Okay, great. And his symptoms started about uh, nine years ago. I, I can't, I just can't open them at all now. Sometimes I can do this and, and I can keep them open for a little bit. So if you lift your yeah. eyebrows up yeah. with it your just, left yeah. hand or either one. Until, until I, I do it with my left hand until it gets tired. It's just, it's, it's incredibly uh, f fatiguing. I mean, it's hard to do. Eight years, I started, uh, uh, my eyes would spasm closed. And, and as time went on, it got, it got worse and worse. I, I didn't really think it was gonna work because I've tried so many different things yeah. that hadn't worked. And all of a sudden, about about uh, well, about about eight weeks after I started up in the up yeah. in the voltage, I woke up one morning and, and I, w I didn't have too much trouble keeping my eyes open. And by two o'clock that afternoon, it was gone, it was like it had never been there. Okay. A few times, really tight. Just leave them open and just relax. Okay, so that looks pretty remarkable, right? But let's talk a little bit more detail. How efficacious is DBS uh, for blepharospasm and dystonia? So DBS is uh, commonly used for generalized and cervical dystonia. Um, there are there have been large randomized control studies that have shown the efficacy, and um, we know that certain types of dystonia, certain types of generalized dystonia respond better than others. But again, this is um, fairly well established um, in the um, field of movement disorders. Uh, but what about blepharospasm? So the most we know about blepharospasm uh, comes from patients who have MAGE syndrome. So this is also called cranial dystonia. So these are people who have um, not just the blepharospasm, but they can also have dystonia of the lower mouth. So mouth and jaw or tongue and sometimes even the neck. So there have been several um, open label studies. I will show you some more details. And what these studies have shown that DBS is efficacious in many, but not all patients. Now, the good news for blepharospasm is that eye symptoms respond pretty well typically. So on average about 50% improvement. Whereas for example, speech and swallowing that is commonly a problem in MASH syndrome usually does not respond as well. So this is encouraging for um, people with blepharospasm. Now, what about blepharospasm alone, right? The essential or, or pure primary blepharospasm. There have only been case reports in the, in the literature, such as the one that I just showed you, and I'll show you another one. So we really don't know how many people have had a DBS specifically for blepharospasm. Um, and from these videos, um, you see that it can be extremely efficacious. However, we have to be very cautious because uh, there, there may be bias in reporting, right? So doctors, very much like to um, show when something works. So we're very quick to um, publish a case report when we have amazingly positive outcomes. But uh, when something doesn't work, then we may, we may not be so quick to publish it. And also medical journals will not um, actually accept negative studies. So this can give a very skewed picture of how well um, blepharos, um, DBS works. So again, that's why it's important to have these randomized control studies um, to really establish efficacy. And unfortunately, that is not available yet for either MAGE syndrome or blepharospasm. So here is another uh, video, again, that has been published um, in the medical journal. This one is from Europe. So again, this is before DBS, very classic symptoms of 
inability to open one's eyes. And then here after DBS, you can see that his eyes look much better. Okay. So um, there's a lot in this slide, but I wanted to show you this um, um, table because these are essentially all uh, research studies or all clinical trials that have been published uh, relating to MASH syndrome, cranial dystonia, and DBS. So here in the first column, you can see the location and the year that the study was published. And you can see there are several from the US, um, Asia, Europe, this is the number of patients in the studies. As you can see, these are very small numbers. And again, that's why we have to be cautious about is really saying how efficacious DBS is for cranial dystonia because th this totals to about less than 100 people. Now, it doesn't mean that there were, there were many more people who had been implanted with DBS, but again, we don't have information on those people. We don't know uh, really what happened to them unless um, things are published in medical uh, journals. And here is the average improvement. So um, the first number is overall improvement for the entire face. Um, and then here I pulled out the numbers for the eyes only because uh, this is our topic today. So you can see eyes usually respond pretty well, about 50%, 60 sometimes. Even here, this first study, even up to 78% improvement. But again, there are people, uh, depending on the study, that may have very little improvement. So in this most recent study, about half the patients got less than 30% improvement. So it was really, procedure didn't really work that well. Um, so that is important to remember. And then again, another uh, consideration when you are um, talking to people or reading maybe medical um, literature yourself, is the duration of follow-up. How long were these patients followed? So something may work very well right after surgery for a couple of months, but then the effect can wear off. So we wanna make sure that this is a sustained benefit uh, for at least a few years. So here's another video. This is a woman who has MAGE syndrome. So you'll notice that she has blepharospasm, but then also she has abnormal movements in her jaw. I'm not playing the sound because this is from Poland, so. Okay, so how does how does this work? Uh, when it does work, how does it work? So um, this is actually an um, area um, of great interest to me. So in addition to my clinical work, I do a lot of research. And so to really understand um, how DBS works, what we uh, oftentimes do is re record brain activity. So in a study uh, that we did a couple of years ago, we used EEG to record um, electrical brain activity from um, surface of the brain. Um, and we did this in patients who ha already had DBS for dystonia. So not just blepharospasm. Blepho in fact, it was mainly generalized in cervical dystonia patients. And then um, we, we measured how much um, synchronization there was between the two uh, left and the right hemisphere. So what we saw is that when the DBS was turned off and when patient symptoms were coming back, uh, there was a lot of synchronization. That This is this blue line here. So there was a lot of crosstalk between the left and the right hemisphere, uh, So which is not not normal, uh, whereas when the DBS was turned on, this is the red line, you can see that this abnormal synchronization reduced with the DBS on, so when the symptoms were under control, and the black line is he healthy control. So normally there shouldn't be very much crosstalk between the left and the right motor centers, and when there's too much synchronization, we think that's when these involuntary um, movements happen uh, because of the problem with the motor coordination. So DBS 
um, in these people reduced this abnormal synchronization in the motor, co motor cortex. But again, a lot more um, research is needed on this topic. And um, to my knowledge, um, this study, a similar study has not been done um, in people with DBS and blepharospasm. So uh, when should someone consider DBS for blepharospasm? First, it is important to have a definitive diagnosis by a movement disorders neurologist. Second, um, there should be insufficient relief of symptoms by medications and botulinum toxin injections. So if somebody is having good benefit uh, from botulinum toxin, uh, probably not a good idea to undergo brain surgery. But if um, there is insufficient um, improvement from these therapies, or if maybe at some point botulinum toxin injections work, but over time they stop working, then it may be reasonable to consider surgery. Also to consider uh, brain surgery, uh, we really need um, to see that blepharospasm is causing significant disability and poor quality of life. Because again, this is um, an invasive surgery um, and is important to not um, uh, expose patients to unnecessary risk unless um, the um, benefit outweighs the risk. And then it is important to have realistic expectations. So as I've shown you, we unfortunately don't know um, if surgery will always work. Um, for Tremor and Parkinson's disease, we can predict pretty well who good candidates are. But in dystonia and blepharospasm um, as well, even patients who have seemingly a uh, very similar condition and electrodes are placed in the same part of the brain, they may have very different um, outcomes. So number one, uh, people have to be uh, sort of ready that this is not a guaranteed success. And then two, um, it is not a complete cure. So you, can, you saw from those studies that on average, there's about 50% improvement. So for somebody who has very severe symptoms, 50% improvement can really be um, very meaningful because it can put them in that mild to moderate category. But for somebody who maybe um, has mild symptoms, 50% improvement will still keep them in the mild symptom category. So again, this is a procedure that is really reserved for patients with severe, um, severe spasms um, and significant disability. So in conclusion, um, I have shown you today that deep brain stimulation uh, can be effective for generalized and cervical dystonia. And there is increasing evid evidence for efficacy in cranial dystonias, including blepharospasm. However, uh, outcomes are variable and we therefore need more research. This is the Emory uh, deep brain stimulation team. These are my colleagues that I work with. Uh, you can see that we have um, people from neurology, neurosurgery, neuropsychology, psychiatry, and um, neurophysiology. So a big team to make this happen. And here, is, um, here are our two websites that describe this procedure in more detail, and then our phone number for our Emory Brain Health Center. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Mia Sinovich. I would like to ask everyone to just hold their questions until after Dee's presentation, and then we'll come back and, and because they can ask questions sure. of both of you at the sure. same time. Okay, thank you very, very much. Now, Dee, if you will turn your camera on. There you go. Um, let me get you set up. Go ahead. Okay. First, I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this. I, I learned a lot here today, this morning. Even though I've had DBS for 21 years, I still learned a lot. So I was diagnosed with medication-induced tardive dystonia in 1997. My entire body was affected, including my eyelids, and I felt like I had been given a life sentence for a crime I didn't commit. 
My fine motor skills were non-existent. I could not button my blouse. I couldn't zip a zipper. I couldn't even feed myself without spilling food everywhere because I shook so much. Plus, I kept walking into walls and doors. I'm sure a lot of you know what that's like. I was basically non-functional as well as functionally blind for several years, and I lived on the floor. I would place my dinner plate on the floor next to my head and literally scoop the food into my mouth. I was in so much pain, both physically and emotionally, and all I wanted to do was die. There was no way I was going to spend the rest of my life like this. I was only 44. Prior to my diagnosis, I had been a psychotherapist in private practice, and now I had to give that up. How could this have happened to me? I was so angry at myself for letting this happen. I was angry at the doctor who misdiagnosed and mismedicated me, and I was angry at the world. I went from doctor to doctor trying to find some relief. None of the usual medications used to treat dystonia were helping me at all, and my dystonia was so um, evenly distributed throughout my whole body that they didn't know where to inject uh, Botox, so that wasn't an option either. Finally, in 2000, I was referred to Dr. Philip Starr, a neurosurgeon at U University of California, San Francisco, and the VA in San Francisco, who was doing a new unapproved procedure called deep brain stimulation surgery. And as Charlene already mentioned, uh, by this time I was desperate for some relief, so brain surgery didn't sound so bad. Now I had two choices suicide or surgery. And since the suicide, since the surgery was reversible, if it didn't work, I opted for the DBS. I was given a 50-50 chance of success, but anything was better than nothing. Dr. Starr told me that it would not help with the blessed and could possibly make them worse. But again, I didn't care. I just wanted relief from the physical pain. So in March of 2000, I had the first of two EBS surgeries, one side at a time. A month later, doctors start and plan at the other side. The first side took 14 hours and the second side took nine hours. Now today, they can do both sides, the whole thing, the leads, the, the simulators, everything in about four hours. And that's amazing. Anyway, all of my symptoms, except for the bluffs, went away immediately. I was spasm-free and pain-free. And this is what's called the honeymoon phase and it's due to the brain swelling. However, as the swelling subsided, some of the symptoms returned. And now, as Dr. Miosinovich said, the hard part begins, the programming. I had an awesome programmer who was experienced with programming for Parkinson's, but didn't know much about dystonia. Together, we muddled our way through settings, and within six months, we found my optimal settings. And I have kept the same settings for 21 years. This is very unusual and atypical, but I was one of the lucky ones. But what about the bleth? I didn't want to get Botox injections. Why would I want to put yet another toxin in my body? I read somewhere that botulism toxin is six million times more toxic than the most toxic snake venom. So of course I didn't want any more toxins in my body. However, my movement disorder specialist at the VA, Dr. Bill Marks, convinced me to try Botox. So I finally did and it worked. I could drive again. I wasn't walking into walls anymore. I could walk my dog and I didn't need my friend and fellow dog lover to guide us anymore. So for the next three years, I got Botox injections for blepharospasm. And then all of a sudden in 2003, I didn't need Botox anymore. So now I don't take any medications for dystonia and no injections for blepharospasm. And I'm so very lucky because my response to DBS is not typical. DBS has come a long way in 21 years. For example, when I first had DBS, I had two batteries implanted, one on each side. And every two years, I would have to get the batteries replaced. And that's a surgical procedure. In 2010, however, I converted to the new rechargeable battery, which will last up to 15 years. Initially, the only way I could tell if my stimulators were turned on or off was to hold a transistor radio up to my chest, set the radio to the lowest AM frequency. And if I heard static, I knew the stimulators were on and working. 
and we were also issued a powerful magnet to turn the stimulators on or off. This is the first access review, a handheld device that replaced the magnet. It, it can only be used to check to see if your stimulator was on or off or to turn the stimulator on or off. And these are some of the batteries or stimulators. The one on the left is the Kinetra, which was pretty big and it's not used anymore. And the one on the right is the Soletra. That's not used anymore either. The Activa PC and the Activa RC are newer and are programmable. Also showing is the old access review and the new recharger device. Today, I have a handheld patient programmer that allows me to check the charge level of my stimulator, turn it on and off, and adjust the programming within preset parameters if I need to. I have to recharge once a week, and Medtronic recently came out with a wireless recharger. This is my current recharger with the antenna, and I'll be getting a new wireless recharger later this month. I usually recharge while lying on the couch watching TV. I place the antenna disc over the battery, turn on the recharger by pressing the green button, and just relax for the next two hours or so. In 2002, I founded the DBS for Dystonia Bulletin Board on Yahoo, which has now been moved to Facebook and is an official Dystonia Medical Research Foundation resource. All are welcome, all blepharospasm patients, dystonia patients, everyone is welcome. So thank you. Thank you, Dee. Uh, let's check and see what questions we have. Um, I think that you answered some of these. Uh, is it covered by insurance? I think you said yes. Yes, typically, typically um, it's covered by insurance. But if and that includes Medicare. Okay. Yes, Medicare usually, yeah, we don't have problems, but sometimes private insurances may cause problems, but uh, usually we can, we can get it covered for dystonias. Okay. If someone had to pay for it himself, what would it cost? $100,000. A lot. A lot, yes. <laughs> okay. I have had Parkinson's for over 10 years. I had successful DBS operation in 2018. From a few months after my operation, I have had increasing issues with my eyelids. This has now been diagnosed as blepharospasm. Botox injections around my eyelids do not seem to be helping. In fact, it may even be making things worse. If, as seems possible, the DBS operation has caused or contributed to the problem, could anything be done surgically to correct this? Yeah, this is a great question. So uh, we do see this um, sometimes in people who have Parkinson's disease and who receive subthalamic deep brain stimulation. Um, they can develop blepharospasm um, or sometimes what's called apraxia of eyelid opening. So they may not necessarily have spasms around the eyes, but their eyelids just um, uh, stay down and they won't come up unless you pull them up. So, so yeah, so this has been described as a side effect, a rare side effect of DBS. So um, there are some strategies um, to deal with it uh, by adjusting either the stimulation or even the medications, the levodopa dosage. So in some people, um, uh, reducing the stimulation can actually improve the blepharospasm. And then in some people, paradoxically, actually higher stimulation helps. So um, I would recommend that you work with your um, DBS doctor to try these strategies um, of re either reducing, I would first start with just trying to reduce the volume, um, the, the, the size of the voltage field. Um, and then if that makes things worse, um, then you can actually go in the other direction. And then same thing with levodopa. You have to um, sometimes try to adjust the dose um, and see if that may, may help. Um, where do the wires go? Can they be seen? Can you shower or wash your hair, etc.? Yeah, so the wires are um, underneath the skin, um, and so you can't really necessarily see them. You can feel them, uh, but maybe D, you can you can sort of describe um, and, your experiences. Yeah, the wire goes from the top of my head. I call them my little horns because they're little lump, bumps up there, and goes down behind my ear where they connect. And then it goes down my neck here. And I think you can see this wire right here. And certain times and certain ways I move my head, like if I'm really cold, 
I can feel the, when, if I move my head, I can feel the wires pulling the stimulator a little bit, but it's not really uncomfortable. And I mean, it's, it's a heck of a lot more comfortable than the dystonic spasms that I had before. And yes, you can wash your hair, you can go swimming and, and you can live your life. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure I understand this one just says med options, question mark. Does that make sense to you guys? Um, okay, what? So they may be asking about medication options. Yeah, I, I, that's what I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. So there are medication options. So we use the um, similar medications uh, for blood flow spasm that we use in dystonia. So there are usually three, um, three types of medications. Um, so there are um, benzodiazepines or sedatives such as um, clonazepam or Valium. Uh, there are muscle relaxants such as baclofen. Um, and then there are anticholinergic agents such as Artane. So again, all those um, are, are worth, a try, worth a try. And I would recommend that you work with your neurologist on figuring out the best one. Okay. Um, how long is the recovery? Uh, Dee, do you wanna? address that from yours well so. let's see it was 21 years ago but it wasn't very long um i think i was in the hospital just overnight and then home the next day and you just have to take it easy for maybe two weeks you know and make sure you keep the incisions clean and keep your hands away because you, i had my head shaved so it was really itchy and you're you know the natural instinct is you just want to scratch but you want to keep your hands away from the incision. So I would say give yourself a month, at least a month to recover from it. Maybe maybe six weeks. What do you think, Dr. Masinovich? you think so? Yeah, yeah. I mean, usually, yeah, people stay in the hospital overnight. Um, and then, yeah, we they definitely take, uh, ask them to take it easy for, for a week or so, especially also um, lifting heavy things. You don't want to lift heavy things because you don't want to pop that um, chest incision. Um, and then for the first um, six weeks, we advise people not to actually go swimming to a pool or something to, again, make sure that everything heals well. Uh, but it's, it's usually pretty, pretty yeah, easy recovery. And for battery replacement, it, the battery replacement is really simple. It's an outpatient procedure. And the surgery itself only takes about 20 minutes. But, you know, it takes like an hour to get you prepped and then... 20 minutes for the surgery and then maybe an hour or so in the recovery afterward. And then you go home and, and two weeks later you go back, get your stitches out and, you know, don't lift anything for two to two to four weeks afterward. So it's pretty simple. Okay. Um, what do you expect as changes in the next three years, uh, i.e. smaller devices, more accurate targeting or more dystonia covered? Are those things that you anticipate coming in the next two to three years or more? Yeah, so um, the batteries have become smaller. So, um, and then also we have gotten um, rechargeable devices as Dee mentioned uh, now. Um, another um, development has been uh, what are called segmented leads um, or directional leads. So normally the, the picture of a, of a brain um, electrode that I showed you has these ring contacts. So the current spreads equally in all directions. But now we have these segmented contacts where you can just turn on one side so you can sort of um, focus the stimulation uh, maybe in one area a little bit uh, more. So that can sometimes help us, helps us shape the field uh, and maybe get a, a slightly better benefit. Um, and then another big um, uh, um, future development is not yet uh, available clinically is what's called adaptive or smart DBS. So I mentioned briefly that um, we record brain activity to understand how dystonia changes. So now there's a big um, interest in the uh, DBS um, uh, development and research to have devices that can um, sense brain activity and then adjust, self-adjust the stimulation uh, as needed based on the uh, abnormal brain activity. So that should be coming um, in the next few years, hopefully. Okay, good. Um, I think you guys answered this one. Is this one hospitalized or is this walkout surgery? It sounds like you at least spend a night in the ho uh, hospital when you initially start changing the battery as outpatient. Correct. Correct. Yes. Um, I think there was one about what hospitals provide surgery in. 
the Northeast. Right, right. I saw that. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, there, there are many, yeah, many, many um, centers. Um, for Estonia, probably I would recommend um, going to um, a larger academic center where they have more experience because Estonia is not as common as Parkinson's disease and tremor. Um, so, so having an experienced team um, that has seen and treated patients with Estonia, and again, usually those are in, in larger academic centers associated with universities. Okay. Um, let's see, taking half a gram of lorazepam daily, is that a long-term concern? Long-term concern? It could be, um, again, depending on person's um, specific clinical features, characteristics. So lorazepam is one of those medications I mentioned, they're sedatives or benzodiazepines. Um, so they, um, they can cause, um, sometimes in older people, cognitive issues, balance issues, um, long-term use can also, uh, people can develop um, tolerance and addiction to the sedatives. So uh, we are always um, a little bit careful or doctors should be careful when prescribing these but again, those are also the main, uh, one of the main um, drug classes for dystonia. So we do oftentimes use them. Sometimes what I recommend is to actually use a long acting benzodiazepine such as clonazepam as opposed to lorazepam because lorazepam is very short acting. So if you're using it for dystonia, uh, then it may be better to use a longer acting agent so that this is something that you can discuss with your physician. Okay. Um, does anyone have plans for more controlled clinical trials for DBS in blepharospasm? So I'm not aware of any clinical trials going on right now in DBS for blepharospasm. Um, that's not to say that someone may not be planning it, but um, I'm not aware of any right now. A great website to check is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so that uh, website lists um, trials, not just in the U.S., but even um, around the world for various conditions and actually I just checked it recently to see what's new in the world of blood for us before speaking to you uh, guys and I didn't see anything on DBS. Um, it's difficult because it's again dystonia is a rare condition so um, multiple centers have to come together to make it work and, and it takes a lot of coordination and effort and uh, but hopefully it'll happen. Okay. Does the battery pack interfere with x-ray or MRI, CAT scans, etc.? Um, so the newer, the newer devices um, are MRI compatible. So X-ray and CAT scans are fine with the device, even the older ones. The concern before was with the MRI scan, uh, but now the uh, devices um, are MRI compatible. So uh, there are still some precautions that have to be taken if you have one of these devices when you have an MRI, uh, but um, usually that can be used work around. Okay. And don't you have to use the low intensity coil MRI? Yeah, exactly. You're right. So, so most devices, uh, you have to use 1.5 Tesla MRI, but actually the new Medtronic device is uh, now, now approved up to three Tesla, so they can use the higher strength MRIs. Okay. Okay. Um, if it fails or is minimally effective, do you remove the devices and any common issues? Or the are there any common issues or effects with that? Um, typically, no. I mean, devices can be removed um, if they're not effective. Um, so again, I always um, warn people that it can take up to a year to see if the device is effective. So um, I would, again, wait at least a year, make sure that programming has been done um, by somebody who knows about programming for dystonia. And then if that, at that point, it really doesn't work, which again, sometimes does happen in Estonia, then yes, the device can be removed. Oh, do you alert in an airport scan? <laughs> D, do you alert? <laughs> you know, the GSA? Uh, well, one time I was walking, and this was when I had my old battery, the original batteries, you know, the older ones. And I was walking into a store through the... Um, do their security scanners there? And all of a sudden I felt a surge. Like my, it, it may cause my stimulator a power surge and it wasn't very comfortable. Um, and I've never set off the alarms at the airport, but I have a little card that tells me, you know, that tells PSA that I have an implanted device. So I always, I always go for the grope 
when I travel. I have them pat me down. I don't go through the scanners. I can go through the full body scanner, but I don't go through the metal detectors. And they're always really, you know, they're really good about working with me. So I've never had any problem. Yeah, I, I remember on Advocacy Day uh, in Washington, D.C., when we were going into the Capitol, um, they were warned in advance that there were a lot of people who would not be able to go through the metal detectors because of DBS surgery. Right. Yeah, the newer devices, um, yeah, they don't um, usually, they, they, they no longer like turn off if you're next, if you're going through a store metal detector or sometimes people are even saying if you're next to a microwave. So th 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 those are no longer issues. But yeah, so the, for the airport, yeah, we still um, tell people not to go through the metal detectors uh, and they pat it down or go through the skinny ones. And not to be wanded either because the wand yeah. has a more concentrated mag mag magnetic concentration than the scanners do. Exactly. Does everyone need to have to shave their heads to have the surgery? So that depends on the surgeon and their practice. Um, so um, again, you know, back early when, when B had her surgery done, uh, it was more common to shave the entire head. But now with more practice and experience, um, surgeons don't necessarily shave the whole head. So for example, at our center, we only do a patch right here. So you can um, keep most of your hair and then wear a head scarf or like a, a headband mm -hmm. until, until it grows back. Okay. Is it possible that my DBS operation for Parkinson's might have damaged the brain irreversibly? You mentioned ophthalmic procedures. Have you come across frontalis suspension and is this effective? It's a lot of questions in one question. Uh, oh, this is, this is the gentleman who, who had that initial question about Parkinson's disease. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you can, again, you can, turn the device off, right? And then see if uh, blood flow spasm may resolve. Now, again, that could cause worsening of your other Parkinson's symptoms, but I would only do this um, after discussing it with your physician. Um, and then um, the, the procedure that you mentioned, the frontal suspension, that, that is a um, um, procedure on the eye itself. So this is outside of my area of expertise. So this is something ophthalmologist would do uh, so unfortunately, I can't um, advise you whether or not how effective it is, um, but it sounds like it's definitely, um, I would first, you know, explore options with adjusting your deep brain stimulation um, and, and medications that can oftentimes be very helpful. And that appears to be the last question that we have. So, wow, we did, timed it perfectly. It's almost exactly an hour. So um, thank you all for attending. Um, if you want to see this again, if you want to see some of this information again in a week or two, this will be up um, on our YouTube site, which will be accessible through our website and through our Facebook page. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Miasinovich so much for taking the Saturday afternoon to spend with us and Dee for sharing your experience. That, that's just really, really valuable from both of you. Thank you, thank you so much. I have just a little bit more. Can you guys see this on your screen? Yes. Okay. So this is what's coming up in the rest of 2021. This is our 40th birthday year. And one of our biggest presents to everybody is our <clears throat> entirely new website that we're going to have. So I hope you'll, you'll check that out. Uh, we're targeting, I think, now June as for the big reveal. Um, also, we are transforming our Facebook page to be a beacon of information. So if you like us on Facebook, you will get the latest information that we post on your personal feed, uh, Facebook news feed. So, so that's something to do. We have our fifth webinar coming up um, on June in on June 26th, cranial dystonia, blepharospasm, and oromandibular dystonia, and alternate alternative to Mage syndrome. And that's going to be uh, led by Dr. Joseph Jankovic, who's very renowned in this field. So I hope that you'll, you'll join us for that. And then finally, um, 
October 8th and 9th, 2021, we're on for our symposium in, in Philadelphia. So I hope that you're making plans to, <clears throat> as we come out of this pandemic and we're all wanting to travel again, that you're making plans. There's a lot uh, of benefit about going in person um, and having being able to socialize with, with other um, blepharospasm and, and oromandibular uh, dystonia patients. So we hope that you'll do that. And don't forget that your donations make pro programs like this possible. So thank you so much for coming today and uh, everybody have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.